I'm Jeff Yarger. I'm a professor of chemistry, biochemistry, and physics at Arizona State Uni University. Today I'd like to introduce the laws and postulates uh, that govern the foundation of thermodynamics. And thermodynamics is the theory or mathematical foundation uh, that we use to understand the macroscopic world and the transformation of energy within the macroscopic world. Um, and when we speak of various kinds of energy, a lot of things come to mind that we've had from previous experience in, in introductory chemistry and physics classes. In physics, things like the kinetic energy uh, versus its potential and how the two interplay with each other. In chemistry, a lot of times we think of chemical energy in numerous forms, whether we're talking about chemical energy like uh, it within a nuclei, where we think of nuclear energy, or chemical energy because of how the electrons move, electricity, electrical energy, etc., as well as other things like surface energies and strains, etc. So we have a lot of different uh, concepts of, of types of energy we're, we're interested in. And when we speak of these various kinds of energy, we often say something like, you know, uh, kinetic energy, for example, that, it, you know, energy possesses, um, uh, you know, the energy possessed by a body uh, in virtue of its motion is kinetic energy, while energy... Um, possessed by a body in virtue of its position within a field, within some type of energy field, would be a potential energy. And, you know, uh, some type of energy possessed, uh, you know, by a body in virtue of its temperature would be a thermal energy. Uh, energy possessed by virtue of a chemical substance might be some type of chemical energy or even, again, some subset of it, like the energy of the nuclei would have some type of nuclear energy while the electrons would have some type of electricity or electrical energy associated with them. And we usually use terms like, you know, for example, a generator produces electrical energy or a motor produces mechanical energy in a system. And when we say that, you know, the, the electrical energy produced by a generator, it didn't come from nothing. It came from somewhere, right? And so usually, you know, um, we think of um, a mechanical device such as a turbine was needed to produce that. And, and it's following the changes in energy that are fundamentally what we do uh, and their transformations that we do in thermodynamics. So the laws uh, that you will find in most textbooks, whether they're in, in physics, uh, chemistry textbooks, biochemistry, et cetera, um, you know, date back to the Industrial Revolution and kind of have a, a historical sense that is why we have a zeroth law, et cetera, because it, it came after uh, some of these, et cetera. And I'm not gonna go into a lot of the historical foundation of this because it's so well documented in, in so many books. Um, you know, for example, uh, you know, several books on, on general thermodynamics where uh, this is one that I provide to to um, students online, but there are so many general physical chemistry and, and specific thermodynamic books in physics, chemistry, chemical engineering, biochemistry, et cetera. Uh, instead, I just wanna briefly review some of them and, and point out some salient overall features. And the first is, the first law is what gets discussed the most, especially in chemistry, and what we just gave context to, that thermodynamics is really looking at different kinds of energy and their transformation. And what the first law says, generally, is that energy is conserved, that the total energy in the universe is staying the same, or that energy can be neither created nor destroyed, uh, a type of fundamental thought, so that we're really just bookkeeping when it comes to uh, thermodynamics. We're just following where the energy goes into different and, and guiding it into different things. But overall, it stays, you know, the same when you account for everything. Um, and, and that's probably one of the fundamental tenets of, of thermodynamics. 
The other ones all, in a sense, help us understand this idea of heat better. So the energy, the internal energy of a system, can be broken up into work and heat. And work we have a good sense for. We got a good sense for it in fundamental, uh, in, in introductory chemistry and physics classes, mechanical work, you know, doing some type of force pushing things over a certain length. Um, you know, in chemistry, looking at, you know, ideal gases and different pressures and volumes to do different types of mechanical work. In, in introductory physics, where we do electricity and magnetism to see electrical work or magnetic work, etc. So we have a very good sense for these type of, of work and how they relate, you know, to energy directly and how we can bookkeep them and add them up and transform them, etc. It's heat. Where, we, where thermodynamics uh, really needs, makes a statement. And, and so there's, uh, we basically define what heat is. And we define it in terms of a new variable that we call entropy. And it's really the second law that says that that entropy tries to become a maximum. The third law that says as you approach an absolute reduction in the energy, so a reduction in the temperature that you also get to an absolute value or, or a, a zero of, of in, uh, entropy as well. Um, and even the zeroth law of thermal equilibrium that when you put two bodies uh, in contact with each other with walls where they can equilibrate that they basically equilibrate by maximizing their entropy and equilibrating you know, their temperature or, or uh, becoming where the macroscopic variables don't change over time and they don't have any history uh, or hi historic effect associated with them once you hit these equilibrium states. And this causes a lot of interesting, these end up being state variables, meaning they're no longer dependent on their path. So unlike um, how the work and heat can change, uh, those are path dependent, and that's why some bookkeeping, we often use these uh, small deltas. Uh, the other term that often gets used is a D with a line through it, indicating that it's a path dependent change or infinitesimal change in something. So uh, these two are the most common terms used, either a small uh, Greek delta or um, uh, basically a D with a, a line for a derivative that it's a path dependent. And so these are, while the work and the heat independently are path dependent, the quantity that when you bookkeep all of them together is path independent. It's a state variable, the internal energy. It doesn't depend on the path you took. It only depends on its original condition and the final condition it was in. So, uh, and like I said, most of these laws are helping us define heat in terms of temperature, which we have a, a great under, you know, we have a natural intuition of just dealing with the macroscopic world in this new variable entropy, which is what we'll be dealing with a lot throughout the course of this semester. The other thing we saw, we, we see is that all these work terms come in this intensive, extensive uh, conjugate field pairs. So whether you're talking about, you know, mechanical work with pressure volume, uh, whether you're talking about, um, you know, some type of, you know, magnetic moment uh, into its magnetic field, uh, whether you're talking about a chemical potential into uh, the change in the number of moles, so whether you're talking about chemical work or magnetic work or, or PDV mechanical work, uh, it always takes this form. The other thing that we've that is critical to point out and is one of the, what I would call practical when using thermodynamics to solve problems, et cetera, that comes up a lot is this idea of what we're looking at as far as what is considered uh, work coming into and out of the system. So, uh, you know, the typical way we use it as chemists is to, uh, is to use the convention that uh, the work performed on the system by the surroundings is positive. Uh, so this leads to the change uh, in the work so that we usually use the positive. Now classically in physics, uh, 
it can often be the, op the opposite that we consider that a negative work. And so this is the way we usually use it in, in, in chemistry and the way I will use it uh, throughout this course. So this will always come down you know, as a positive uh, value here. So besides uh, the most common way, which is through the, these four laws, the three laws and the zeroth law of, of thermodynamics to define it, uh, Herbert Callan popularized uh, a method with postulates, with four postulates to define uh, the thermodynamics and the theory uh, that we use. And it's very similar to the three laws, except there's one clear, you know, obvious omission here. And, you know, for a very detailed, you can uh, see his book uh, directly on this subject, um, which is, you can see here, in a sense now, every single one of them is basically helping us define entropy, right? It's not even talking about energy directly. It's only talking about energy with respect to entropy. So you can already see three out of the four laws uh, are really about entropy or heat. Here, all four, in a sense, are, are about heat. Uh, and it's, you know, the, the idea of conservation of energy is, is almost just assumed, in a sense. So, and in that case, where we normally write what I think of as the fundamental uh, law of thermodynamics, where we're typically, as chemists especially, where, we're, where I explicitly show out the chemical work and the type of mechanical work we usually do in chemistry, which is PDV, and anything else would be some extra uh, work term uh, you know, if we had some type of magnetic field or electric charge, uh, et cetera, uh, we would always kind of consider that as an extra case. But this being, so we have our heat term, which is always TDS, and typically the two types of work we deal with in chemistry and biochemistry are, are mechanical work, PDB work, and chemical work. And that's usually what we're looking for in these systems. And so, um, the, the postulate number one looks at that there is an equilibrium state, but instead of looking at it in this way, you can just rearrange the equation, and this is really how, you know, Callan looks at it. You look at it from, you know, an equilibrium state where if you have internal energy volume, and this is meant to be uh, the, a capital sigma, the sum and the number of moles, or all the different chemical constituents, um, that, uh, you know, the equilibrium, there is an equilibrium state that's defined where the macroscopic variables in this isolated system no longer changes. And it's defined by where the entropy is a maximum. And it defines some properties of entropy, that it's additive over different parts of the subsystem, that it's continuous and differentiable, and that it increases uh, with, with energy. But then as you go to an absolute zero in temperature. It helps to find an absolute zero in temperature and therefore a standard state or an absolute zero or where entropy doesn't change as you approach the absolute zero in temperature. Entropy is such a critical component to thermodynamics. It's where we'll spend a fair amount of time. That and applying these thermodynamics to practical and useful biological systems. Um, but I want to point out, uh, that which we'll get to later in this semester, that entropy has a natural, it, it can be explained in numerous different ways, and a lot of these books uh, describe it in a very engineering or practical sense, because that's how it was originally discovered. However, later on, um, Boltzmann came along, and this is in fact from his tombstone, um, and showed that entropy has a fundamental relation to the configurations of atoms or of the microscopic uh, atoms and molecules and particles that we have. It's very controversial at the time, but it's been a huge insight. And more uh, modernly, we would write it as not just a constant, but Boltzmann, the capital B is, is in honor of Boltzmann himself, that it's a Boltzmann constant. And uh, the log that we use here, oftentimes when we write LOG, we think of that as a log base 10 uh, is the assumption we make. And, and this is a natural log that we use most, 
uh, readily in this. And, and W, or oftentimes we'll use an omega as well, are the number of configurations, and these are microscopic. So this is gonna give us a key uh, of how entropy will relate from the macroscopic theory of thermodynamics and allow us to have insights into the microscopic, or vice versa, uses insights from the microscopic to give us uh, a better sense of what's going on in the macroscopic world in chemistry and biochemistry. And these are often, I've written several common terms where you see entropy introduced and used in this way exclusively, which is through, uh, it usually, usually start with a microscopic theory of quantum mechanics, which is probabilistic in nature, and therefore you end up through probability using statistics. So it's called statistical mechanics, where you take those microscopic theories and use large number statistics to get them to the macroscopic. Uh, it's often, you know, another synonym for that is statistical thermodynamics or molecular thermodynamics, and, and Callan typically calls it thermostatistics. So, uh, so we'll get to some of those ideas later in the semester, as well as I'll uh, also mention it has a, entropy has a fundamental relation as a completely separate track to information itself, to what we can define as a fundamental unit of information, the bit, et cetera. And this was uh, developed by Shannon et al. So I like to summarize whether you look at the laws or the postulates of thermodynamics, the aphorism I always remember myself when I think, when somebody asks me, uh, you know, what are the tenets of thermodynamics is, is what Clausius said, which is that the energy of the universe is constant and the entropy strives to reach a maximum. And that more or less summarizes a lot of the, the, the most important salient features of the laws that we use to build a macroscopic theory for thermodynamics. So, um, and then I'll summarize by just saying, um, you know, we often summarize by, by saying the energy, you know, is bookkeeping all of the energies where you can have the work terms and the heat terms and they're path dependent. As we formulate what entropy really is, we can end up coming up with all of these work and heat functions as state variables so that each one of these independently now is path independent, they're state variables, so that we can really start bookkeeping where all of the different work terms and the heat flow to give the overall energy of the system. More concretely, in biochemistry and chemistry, heat is always the same, but we usually limit ourselves to looking at mechanical work and the importance of the change in the chemical uh, system. Uh, so as shown here at the bottom, like, you know, while you can have very complicated biochemical systems, uh, you know, one of the fundamental in something like respiration, it, we use the energy from adenosine triphosphate as it goes to identifying diphosphate um, and a phosphate unit, and then we use some other source of energy like the sun or light to, to uh, convert it back to adenosine triphosphate. But when you do that chemical reaction, we, it's bookkeeping where you can put all that energy into different things. One is obviously heat, but then you can put it into mechanical motion. You can put it into chemical motion where you do some types of reactions. You can put it into electrical where maybe you charge separate something uh, across a membrane, et cetera. And it's keeping track of all those different energy terms and knowing that they're overall conserved. So, um, next time, or in future lectures, uh, we'll be covering just a, some basics about what uh, equilibrium and its uh, implications on reversible thermodynamics. We'll have a lecture that just kind of focuses on some of the common mathematics, the mathematics of partial differential equations. Um, experimentally, Nine times out of 10, if you're doing some type of experiment that's directly giving you thermodynamics, it's calorimetry in nature, uh, looking at the temperature changes and things. Um, and then it's very important that modern thermodynamics is such a developed theory and we're able to use it at such high levels through statistical mechanics that we can uh, do these often computational experiments, which give us huge insights from the molecular level of how macroscopic things changes. And so we'll be looking at that and then we'll further develop. And all of this is at um, biopchem.education. Thank you.